Okay, folks, how you doing? How are you, man? How you doing? Good to see you. Happy Good Friday. Amen. All right, man. Let's wait a few minutes. Hopefully we trust by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that the modem won't start acting up. There'll be no buffering in Jesus' name. Hopefully it'll be 100% better than it used to be. It's now 99%. It buffers slightly, but we trust by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ, our Lord, will bless the session. There goes Pastor Leland. Say hi to Pastor Leland, guys. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. He's doing now live streaming, I believe, where he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He used to be my pastor in my former neck of the woods. I won't mention where. Well, I mean, he doesn't live there. I don't live there anymore anyway. But anyway, so Pastor Leland, pray for that man. Pray for his family. The Jesus Christ, our Lord, blesses him. And like I said, subscribe to his YouTube channel because he does streams, from what I understand, on YouTube. Because problem is he can't have church services, can't have church services in his church. He's got to do it at home because of the quarantine, right? How ironic. How ironic. Easter weekend. I know a lot of people don't like to use the term Easter. Yep. First Baptist Church. Like the page. Also on the Facebook. Do that for me. Do that for me because I can tell you. I don't just say in front of him. Remember I've said there are people out there still who love Jesus Christ, who love the Bible and believe it is the perfect word of God and preach it with conviction and authority. I go, because Jesus Christ, our Lord, has not abandoned his church and our Lord Jesus Christ is faithful to raise up godly men who won't compromise, who believe that book and love that book and seek to understand, interpret that book and live it for the glory of Jesus. He's one of them. He's one of them. So you have many men of God still who love Jesus Christ and are filled with the Spirit. And he's one of them. I can say that. And Al D, who's here, Al D was also a, one of his former members. Al D, he can confirm as well. So he's going to be talking about the book. Uh, he said Enoch. Oh, he's going to talk about Enoch. Genesis 5, 21, 24, and Hebrews 11, verse 5. So pray for him that the Lord bless him. He's going to be doing it on where? You're going to be live streaming on Facebook or on YouTube? Anyway, anyway so praise God. Well, let's wait a few more minutes. We'll, uh, we'll begin in prayer in Jesus' name. I've had a very rough day from last night till today. Satan really has tried to stir up the hornet's nest. Satan has really been, really been, pricking his agents to attack me. Little do they realize I attack right back and I've turned my cheek and I run out of cheeks to, to turn. You should see the backlash I've gotten from the Kwaku fiasco last night. Here we got another Muhammad and you see the son of Satan. Okay, a son of Satan who won't call Skype to defend his prophet a Mohammedan who follows a woman raping, woman prostituting pedophile. And it's true, guys, I'm sorry. I won't be politically correct. Muhammad prostituted women. Those of you who study Islam know he called it muta, temporary marriage. And he licensed his jihadi thugs to rape women that they took captive, even if they were married. That's in the Quran and the Hadiths. We're not lying. We're not lying. We're speaking the truth. Okay? We're not lying. Chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. I'm not lying. Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2150. Hadith number 2150. So we're not lying. And yet these, these, these demons who are demonized like their prophet was, may Jesus Christ the Lord set them free, bring them to the truth, will attack our faith, but they'll bat an eye at the filth of their prophet. Yeah. You should see the backlash I've been getting from last night from Mormons. And also some who think they're being Christ-like, who think they're Christian because they said that I didn't let them speak. Now, again, guys, if you actually go back and listen carefully, go listen carefully. It was cross-examination. He was supposed to ask me questions I was supposed to answer. Go back and listen. I'm not trying to justify anything, but did he let me answer questions? Would he let me make my, my point and answer question questions? Go see it. 
You guys watch it, right? Okay. I was trying to be nice, but I also wanted to respond and not let him get away with misrepresentation. And so he left. But now the Mormons who are upset that their star, shining star, because you know why they, they, they prop Kwaku? I don't know if you guys know why they're propping Kwaku. Because he's black and the Mormon church has the reputation of saying black people are cursed because they were a couple of the Israelite tribes that because they rebelled against God, God cursed them with black skin. And so being black is a curse if you go back and study the Mormon sources. So who better than Kwaku, a young guy, parents from Ghana, black guy to be the new face of Mormonism, right? The new face of Mormonism. So when their Mormon champion, this young arrogant punk, ran with his tails between his legs, they didn't like it. So now they have to make excuses. Now, don't get me wrong. He's still young. The Lord Jesus Christ can still convict him by the Spirit and bring him out of the lie of Joseph Smith. And I pray this encounter shook his foundation and will come to the true God. But until he does, he's an enemy and a blasphemer. And people ignore the fact, people ignore the fact that he was attacking our faith in his opening statement. Ad hominem, attacking our faith, saying our, our faith is irrational. No one will, will buy into it anymore because it's outdated, blaspheming our God. But let's forget him being a jerk. Sam, you're the jerk. Come on, man. Right? Go listen to his opening statement. It was an assault against the Christian faith. This generation won't accept that anymore. You know, the ancients and Yahweh and, and you know, all that, you know, spiel. Right? And then I even conceded. I said, look, you don't tell me how to debate or how to answer your questions. But so you don't run. I won't call Joseph Smith a cult, cult leader. I won't call Mormonism a cult anymore just so you don't run. Remember I said that too, right? Oh, you heard him say that? I didn't even hear that. I'm old, huh? 48? So then how old is his mother and father, Zina? Zina, I have to unblock you from my phone too. Jadallah, poor sister. A Syrian sister who got experienced the wrath of Sam Shimon. Now, Zina, when we make the shirts, I got blocked by, blocked by Sam Shimon. You need to be the first one to buy the shirt, and you need to buy at least half a dozen for all your family members. The only one from your family who hasn't been blocked yet, God bless him, is Shu Jesus Miskina. Because he's in the background. He doesn't say anything, even though he may be cussing me out behind the screen. Like, that darn Sam Shimon. I love the guy, but, man, he's too much to handle, man. May God help him with his anger issues. But he doesn't say it in the text, right? See, there he goes. He doesn't say it in the text because, like, man, my brother got blocked because of the flat earth. And my sister got blocked because she got upset at Andrew Martin, right? And Sam's not blocking Andrew Martin. But one day I'm going to surprise you. I'm an equal opportunist. I'll end up blocking Andrew Martin, too, and I'm unblocking him so you can be happy. Okay, so we're waiting a few more minutes, guys, all right? I do need your prayers. Like I said, I've been in a battle from last night after the debate till now. I've been going at it with demons on YouTube, and I've been calling out their bluff one by one. I go, here's my Skype name, Benny underscore Malik3. My Skype is open. Come and school me. Come and put me in my place. Come and embarrass me. Come and shut me up. Stop barking. Stop foaming. Bring a bite. Put me in my place. Defend your God. Come to the aid of your God. Come and do it. And I'm still waiting. One guy came here, Buzz, uh, Buzzsaw. Oh, I don't have Skype. I gave him the link. It only takes a few seconds to download Skype. Yeah, I'm waiting. And then some Christians who think they're mature, mature Christians and spiritual, I called out their bluff and exposed their arrogance and their pride, which they masked with humility. I said, come and then put me in my place. I'm here. I sent you notices, guys. Come and put me on my place. Stop being heroes and warriors behind the screen, 
right, on a keyboard. Come and put me in my place. Unbelievable. Anyway. So help me to help you guys. We want to glorify Jesus. And I know why these attacks. It's not a coincidence. I'm being attacked in order for me to stumble because that's what Satan wants on Good Friday. Satan is smart. He will do anything and everything he can to cause Christians to stumble and sin against the Lord Jesus, especially on such an important day. After I announce, I'm going to do a Good Friday sermon. I know what he's trying to do. Make me lose my peace and my calmness and joy so I don't focus on glorifying Jesus Christ and break down the implication of his death on the cross. Why is it called Good Friday? What makes this Friday good? You see my point? I know what he's doing, but Jesus Christ is almighty God. The Holy Spirit is almighty God, and he lives in us. And he who lives in us is greater than he who's in the world. So we plead the blood of Jesus to cover us and wash us. That gives us victory to crush Satan under our feet by the authority of Jesus, the God of Satan and the judge of Satan and our Savior in Jesus' name. So we're going to begin in prayer in a few minutes and just waiting for you guys to be prepared. Now, pray that the Spirit will anoint us. Pray that our hearts are ready and tender to receive what the Spirit would want me to speak for the glory of Jesus. Pray that the Lord will anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of his servants. Because those who are his servants, and if I'm being used of the Holy Spirit, will delight at the sound of my voice if I speak the words of the Spirit to them. Now, thank you, Basara. God bless you. With that said, the other day I was listening to the stream. And guys, the Lord truly bless you. And the Lord Jesus <clears throat> shine his face on every one of you and your loved ones. The fact that you can listen to my voice, that is the grace of God. I was listening to my voice, and honestly, I was like, my goodness. Wow, this voice of mine. I, I, here, I'm, here, just so you know, I'm not lying. I cannot stand the sound of my voice, honestly. I can't listen to myself. Even now, I'm starting to think, do I really sound the way I do when I play, play my voice? Or do I sound the way I think I sound? Isn't that weird? The way you hear yourself is not the same way that you come off sounding when you listen to yourself, right? Isn't that weird? Man, dude, and I, I can't stand my voice. So guess what I was going to do? Here, Joe, you can prove it. Okay, so you know I'm not lying. So Pray in Jesus' name. I lose that 50 pounds and keep it off. I'm still not at my goal. But pray I keep it off and lose that extra and get my health back if the Lord wants me to be healthy. To use me for the glory of Jesus. You see these shoestrings right here? See these shoestrings right here? I was tempted last night to take these shoestrings and hang myself with these shoestrings. Okay? Depends. Some, sometimes I can fit in a 12 wide. Usually 12, 12 and a half and 13 wide. Uh, yes. I was going to take these shoestrings and hang myself. After hearing my voice. So so these tough guys are not calling. Where are you, tough guys? Come put me in my place. Come show me how I should be preaching the gospel. Come and correct me. Come defend your false God. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, CA. God bless you for your support in Jesus' name. Let's begin and ask the Father to bless for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, you are God and we love you. We love the Lord Jesus. And we love your Holy Spirit and we depend on your Holy Spirit and we need your Holy Spirit and we trust in your Holy Spirit. We pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and enslave us to your Holy Spirit, Father. We don't love you enough and we don't love you perfectly because we're still in these bodies of flesh. But we trust in the Holy Spirit to just fill us with such power to conquer our flesh and crucify our flesh and mortify our flesh. And we ask, Father, for purity, that you wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, as we honor the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross on this Good Friday, which commemorates what your beloved Son, your heart that became flesh, did to reconcile us to your glory, Father. And so, Father, please empower me by your Spirit to do justice to this topic. They're here 
not because they want to listen to me, Father. They're here because they believe and trust your spirit will use me as he does many men and women of faith who love Jesus Christ. So, Father, let your Holy Spirit take over the session. In fact, let him take over our lives completely. Every fabric of our being, we beg that the Holy Spirit will completely possess and attach us to himself and enslave us to himself. We need more of Jesus, less, than a, less of us, Father. Crucify our flesh, Father. Purify our motives and sanctify us by your spirit in the holy blood of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, your beloved son, the Lord Jesus, the virgin-born son of Mary, the Lord Jesus, the son of David, the Lord Jesus, our God, our Lord, our love, our life. Bless this session, Father. Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this. And grant us the holiness to enter your presence by the blood of the Lamb, being transformed by your spirit to conform to the image of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, to be pleasing in your sight. And Father, strengthen my tongue to speak truth without error. Save me from misinterpretation, from confusion, from forgetfulness, from stammering. Enable me by the power of the Holy Spirit to recall all the passages perfectly and interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And bless everyone here with illumination from your spirit, that by your spirit we'll be taken to our level of understanding your word, being more in awe of your word, and falling more in love with the Lord Jesus, because that's the goal of our life, to love Jesus, to worship Jesus, to cling to Jesus, to be like Jesus, and to trust in Jesus, and to walk with Jesus, and to speak with Jesus. Because he's risen, he is alive, and he can never die, and will never die. And we exist because he exists, and we live because he lives. Help me, Father. Help us to breathe in you and to live in you and move in you and have our being in you. And I pray that for, for our loved ones, my daughters especially, Lord. Be with my daughters especially on Good Friday. They're there in another state without me. Remind them how much you love them and that we will be together. By our faith in Jesus, we will be together and we will worship together and, and pray together and love Jesus together. My daughters and me, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. You were there for me when my father abandoned me. And you've never left nor have you forsaken me. And you will never leave nor forsake them because you love and adore them more than I can imagine. You love and adore everyone here. You love and adore their family members more than we can even fathom. And thank you. Thank you that you're a God of perfect love and compassion and mercy. Because if you did not have love, who could stand before you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being who you are and for loving us. We love you, Baba. We love you, Baba. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help your worthless slave to glorify you and to bless your people who love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Sanctify me and fill me with the health and the holiness to bless them. Holy Spirit, bless them as only you can bless them as we not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, the Father, and the Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. I hope it is. I don't like it. Okay. Are we ready? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of stuff to unpack. So guys, do help me. It is a special occasion. Every day for us. Every day for us is Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. True believers who love in Jesus, who love Jesus, who are in love with Jesus, as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue to speak clearly. We celebrate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday every day because we walk with Jesus or we're supposed to walk with Jesus every day and hear the Lord Jesus speak to us to reassure us and to remind us of his love for us daily. But because the world knows today we commemorate the death of the Lord Jesus, let's make it special. Help me to help you. No side talks. Don't get into tangents. Focus on what is being said. Focus on the passages. Ask Holy Spirit to illuminate you and me so we can understand the passages, the depth of these scriptures, right? To unpack them for the glory of Jesus so we can walk away with hearts tender and ready to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Because though he was buried on Friday, the light of the world 
that was swallowed by darkness, or so the kingdom of darkness thought, shone forth with his glorious light, destroying and conquering and crushing the power of sin, Satan, and the grave on Sunday. And that's what we're preparing for. Friday leads to Resurrection Sunday. And that's what we're preparing for, right? Pray more people show up. Okay, now, let's talk about Jesus' triumphal entry. Yeah, this guy is a good salesman. Here's another Mohammedan coward, a dog of Satan, like his prophet was a dog. Hey, crying Sam, can you call me and put me in my place? Sorry, guys, let's muzzle these dogs real quickly. See, I told you, Satan's going to bring his children. Hey, crying Sam, using my name, can you call me and make me cry? Here, let's see if you, you're man enough to defend your prophet. Come on to your pedophile prophet, that son of Satan. He was the best salesman because he deceived you. Call me, crying Sam, or you're going to get blocked. You have a minute to call me, barking dog. I like to muzzle dogs of Muhammad. Okay, even better. Call me so I can muzzle you and your God. Okay. Guys, let's just, let's, let's muzzle this dog. He won't call me. Sorry about that, Pastor Lena. This is the demons I have to deal with on internet. Can you call me crying, Sam? Can you make me cry, you little coward, ashamed to identify yourself? Because even your mother is embarrassed that she gave birth to you. Come on. Come on, little girl. Come here, doggy. Call me crying, Sam. Come here, doggy. Can you call me? Come here, girl. Come here, girl. Come here, girl. Okay. You're not going to call me? Down, girl. I'm sorry. I don't mean to insult dogs. All right. Muzzle this guy. Get him out of here. These cowards, man. No, no, don't say it. All right. Okay, guys. Didn't I tell you Satan is angry? Glory to Jesus. We're going to have the victory in the blood of Jesus. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Pastor Leland, when they come here and mock and blaspheme, they're not interested. So we muzzle them. But you do have Muslims and you do have Unitarians who do listen. There are people listening. You know how you know they're, they're listening? Because they're watching. They don't comment. And when they comment, they ask sincere questions. But these others are not. They're doing a hit and run. And they think, Pastor Lee, I'm one of those guys. Jesus loves you, brother. Yeah, that's okay. Just keep mocking the Lord Jesus and insult him. And then attack his, his church and insult his children. And I'm just going to say, Jesus loves you, brother. Brother, Jesus loved you. It's okay. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. That's I wasn't designed that way. We are the word. Let's go. Triumphal entry. Say, Christian, what's happening? What's happening, baby? You saw he, baby. All right. Let's talk about the triumphal entry so we can segue into Good Friday. Because when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, he was presenting himself to Israel. Let me explain the significance of Jesus riding the foal of a donkey. Are everyone with me now? By the grace of Jesus, are you ready to get into it? And see what the Bible says about the person and work of our Lord Jesus? Hosanna to the highest indeed. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on a foal of a, of a donkey, he was sending a message to the Jews. He was sending a message to Jerusalem. Your divine king has arrived. Let me repeat that again. Thank you, M. Zar. God bless you. Let me repeat the significance. He was presenting himself to Israel as her divine king. He was announcing to Jerusalem, I am your divine king. Coming to bring you salvation if you recognize who I am. Let me repeat that again. Jesus wasn't simply, Jesus wasn't simply presenting himself as the Messiah. God bless you too, Rebel Mark. Thank you, brother. Okay, here's where I need you to listen. Because that act of Jesus was meant to communicate to Jerusalem. He is Yahweh or Yahovah. However you want to pronounce the divine name, you want to pronounce it Yahweh, Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, her king. He was presenting himself more than a human Messiah, but as the divine king who now was entering Jerusalem in the flesh. Are you all ready for me to demonstrate that? Are you now ready for the proof? Who's ready now? And thank 
and bless our mods for helping me to help you by posting verses. Okay, guys, let's read Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Let me unpack this. Light 68, good to see you, sister. It's been a while. Lord Jesus bless you. Guys, I don't know if you know who Light 68 is. She used to be a Muslim. She became a Muslim and then left Islam for Jesus Christ. And now she worships the triune God. The Lord Jesus bless her and preserve her and her family. Okay, Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 10. Let's read now. Glory to God for these people that he's bringing out of darkness. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and cry aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king, Zion, Jerusalem, your king is coming to you. How is he coming to you? He is righteous and able to deliver. He is humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the offspring of a donkey. Now, before I move on, Protestant, don't shock me and tell me you're quoting the Jehovah's Witness Bible. This does not sound like the King James. Oh, MEB? All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Protestant. First, last, don't shock me and tell me you're quoting the MIV. It's okay, but let's stick with the King James. Let's go back to the King James. Because the way the MIV translated here, although you can translate it that way, still the impact and the, the power is missing. Okay, let's try it again. Don't be scared, brother. By the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, he'll bless our unity for the glory of Christ. Here. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, meaning the Gentiles. And his dominion shall be from sea, even to sea and from the river, even to the ends of the earth. Okay, now Zechariah 9 verse 9. They are the best. Sai Christian, that's probably one of the few things that came out of your mouth that was true. I have the best mods in the world, and I have a variety of them. Assyrian, American, haters, lovers, right? Okay. Just Zechariah 9, verse 9. Just Zechariah 9, verse 9. Okay. Now, let's read Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Jerusalem, your king is coming. And how are you going to recognize your king? Your king will come riding an animal. And he's coming not to destroy. Understand the context now. Let's go into the meat. He's not coming to destroy. He's coming to bring salvation to you and also to bring peace to the nations, to unite you and the nations together under his rulership, under his dominion, under his sovereignty and authority, because it says he comes having salvation and he's humble lowly means he's humble he doesn't come with pomp right he doesn't come with arrogance are you with me there he doesn't come grandstanding with a huge entourage he comes humbly he comes lowly so humble and lowly he comes riding an ass the foal of an ass Everyone got that so far? Before I move on. So notice what the passage said. Let's unpack it. The king of Jerusalem is coming. Not to destroy, but to save. He's coming in humbleness and humility. Not in anger and wrath. And he's coming to bring salvation to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And speak peace to the nations. Because he's going to rule the entire earth. And unite all nations under his kingship, his dominion. Right? If you got that part, we can then build on it. Because we're going to have fun today. And may the Lord Jesus bring his flock to hear this. As the Holy Spirit enables me to glorify his name. Okay. So. Now, number one, here's what I want you to pay attention. The text does not say that the king is the Messiah. Okay. Here's what I want you to pay attention. Here's where Christians who mean well drop the ball by saying this is referring to the Messiah. Number one, it doesn't say this is the Messiah. 
Number two, it doesn't say the servant of Yehovah, Jehovah. Number three, it doesn't say the son of David. or the. In other words, it doesn't use the terms that the Hebrew Bible normally uses to describe the Messiah. It says your king is coming, right? Now, if I ask the Jews and the Christians, who is the king? They'll say the Messiah. Eh. No, not here. It's not saying it's the Messiah. And why I don't want you to say it's the Messiah, you're going to see why in a minute. But what I'm trying to help everyone is to read the text carefully, read the text contextually, because I'm going to show you that the king that's coming, according to Ze Zechariah, is God himself, the God of Israel. Zechariah identifies that king, the king of Jerusalem, who brings salvation, as the God of Israel riding an animal, riding a beast. Now, let me show you the proof. Because Zechariah 9 also wrote Zechariah 14. Zechariah 9 also wrote Zechariah 14. So let's go. Let's now put back to back Zechariah 9, verse 9. With Zechariah 14, verse 9. Let's see who that king is that's coming to rule all creation. Pay attention so you don't lose the point. Okay. Zechariah 9, verse 9. And Zechariah 14, verse 9. Back to back. Let's see if you guys make the connection. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king, Jerusalem, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. So the king is coming to Jerusalem, riding an ass, the foal of an ass, a donkey. But now let's read Zechariah 14, verse 9. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Jehovah and his name one. There you go. The king who's coming to Jerusalem to reign is Jehovah, the only king of all the earth. Right there. And to further prove the king who's coming to Jerusalem is Jehovah, Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. May the Lord Jesus beautiful, beatify my face. Boy, am I ugly. Woo, am I ugly. Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. That's why I'm single, because I'm ugly. Okay, now focus. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And where are they going to find him? And it shall, shall be that the, whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Did you see that according to Zechariah, the king that's coming to Jerusalem, to reign from Jerusalem over all nations, to bring salvation to all nations, to speak peace to all nations who submit to his rule, otherwise they will suffer judgment, is Jehovah of hosts. I want it to sink in before we move on. So when you say Zechariah 9, 9 is about the Messiah, you rob Jesus of the glory of his deity, and you rob yourself of another Old Testament proof that the king of Israel is the God-man. He's God who becomes man. He becomes flesh. Are you, are you with me there? Before I move on and build on this. The king that comes to Jerusalem is said to be Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, Yahovah, Yahweh. He comes to Jerusalem. He reigns as king over the whole earth. He's His authority is one. His name is one. And the nations will be required at least once a year to visit him in his location in Jerusalem to honor him and worship him as their king. But God bless you, Almin. Uh, here's the problem, though. Yeah, hit the like button. 
Here's the problem. Let's go back to Zechariah 9, verse 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Here's the problem. Man, I have a face native and a mother has a hard time moving. Zechariah 9, verse 9. One more time. Guys, focus. I know you love to bless each other. You guys will see each other another day. It's better to focus on the word. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the full of an ass. Now, guys, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? If the king that's coming into Jerusalem is Jehovah, according to Zechariah, how can Jehovah, the God of Israel, be riding an animal, an animal that's flesh, if Jehovah is spirit and doesn't have a physical body? What is Zechariah telling us? Zechariah is telling us our God will appear in physical shape. A physical shape. That is small enough so that he can sit on the foal of a donkey without collapsing the donkey from the weight of his body. Are you with me there? Thank you, Jay. God bless you, brother. Do you understand what you just read? It means Jehovah must be appearing in a physical shape of a certain stature and weight and size that it's not too large, but just the right size to ride a beast without collapsing the beast from the force of the weight. Right? Is that, is that sinking in before I move on to the next point? I hope Luisa's here too. I hope my sister's here. All of you guys. I don't know. Okay. So now let's see the implication and the significance of Jesus now riding into Jerusalem. John 12, verses 12 to 16. John 12, verses 12 to 16. Watch here. John 12, verses 12 to 16. Watch what happens. Watch what our Lord does and why our Lord did what he did. On the next day, much people that were coming to the feast, when they heard that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, behold, your kings, Jerusalem is coming, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found, for some reason, this doesn't read like a King James, that's okay, but it is. And Jesus... In him cried, Hosanna, oh, blessed the king cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, you guys keep texting, I'm going to lose my place. Okay. Yep, I lost my place. Two branches of Santa's. Jesus, when he found a young ass, sat there on as it is written. Fear not, daughter, as it is written, he sat on an ass to enter Jerusalem to fulfill what was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Do you understand why Jesus rode, rode on an ass, the foal of an ass, on a donkey, and entered Jerusalem? Do you now see the significance? He was showing himself to be the God of Zechariah. He was identifying himself as Jehovah God that Zechariah said was coming to reign in Jerusalem, bringing his people salvation. He wasn't simply presenting himself as the Messiah. He was presenting himself as the divine king, Jehovah, Israel's king, who now was walking the earth in flesh as a man. Are you getting it now? 
Are you getting it? Sorry. No zitching. So you understand Jesus is riding the, the donkey, which is mentioned even in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 21, Mark 11. When the Gospels have Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey, that is another witness from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus is Jehovah God of Zechariah. The God, Jehovah, that Zechariah said would come into Jerusalem on a donkey to rule from Jerusalem as king over the earth. So I'm going slow with this because I got to make sure you're getting it. You with me there? So Jesus is starting to fulfill the prophecy. It hasn't been completely fill, fulfilled. This is what we call, and this is something you need to learn about the Bible, the already not yet motif, meaning this prophecy has already begun to be fulfilled, but it hasn't been completely fulfilled, not yet anyway, until Jesus returns. He begins fulfilling it by what he does, but its complete fulfillment takes place when he returns. I don't know why Tony King and Kai Sokol Films are engaging in side talk that is not relevant to glorifying King Jesus, but talking about Muslims. I don't know why they're being disrespectful in doing that. I have no idea. Maybe someone can help me understand. When we're trying to focus on Jesus and Good Friday, but they're talking about Abduls and bits and pieces about Abduls. Okay, for the rest of you who are serious and listening and want to focus on Christ. Okay? Focus on Christ. Okay? Focus on the Lord. Jesus began the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah, but its complete fulfillment awaits his second coming. Can I show you that part? Can I show you that part? He starts the fulfillment of the prophecy, but completes it at his return. Are you ready? Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Yeah. I don't want to talk about Muhammad, anyone else right now. I want to focus on King Jesus and Good Friday. It's about him today. Respect my wishes so we don't distract people by focusing on something else. Today it's about Jesus. It should be about Jesus every day, but especially today when we want to unpack the significance of his cross. Now, Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Read, guys. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Behold, the day of Jehovah, the day of Yahovah, the day of the Lord, Yahweh, cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not come from the city. Right? And now let's read. We got to go back to three and four and five. Hold on. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. Then pay attention now. Three and five is what I want you to. I want you to focus on three to five. Then shall Jehovah, not some created spirit being. The Lord, Jehovah, will go forth against and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, four and five, four and five. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall be removed, shall remove toward the north, and half of it towards the south. Now notice five. And ye, you, survivors, you, survivors, shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, Uzziah king of Judah, and Jehovah, the Lord my God, shall come and all the saints with thee. Post verse 4 one more time. Post verse 4 one more time. No, it's okay. Why are you blocking Alex? Man, my goodness. 
Alex is okay. They're praising God. They can praise the Lord Jesus. They can pray and praise. Well, nothing wrong with praising the Lord. We don't praise him enough. Zechariah 14, verse 4. One more time. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the, toward the west. Now, here we have Jehovah being described with feet. Now, we know it's literal feet. You know how I know it's literal feet, physical feet? Send Josh out of here, please. Get him out of here. You know how we know it's physical feet? It's not metaphorical. You know how we know it's not metaphorical? It's actual physical feet that he's seeing. That he's seeing God with actual physical feet? You got it, Zena and first last. Zena and first last. And Jotling got it. Because from the impact of his feet, the mountain splits in half. So when his feet physically touch the mountain from the impact, it splits in half. So if the splitting in half is actual, then the feet that touch it must be actual physical. God's peacemaker, you're tempting me to get you blocked because you keep chiming in for no reason, thanking people for no reason. We got it the first 20 times. Are you with me there? If the mountain splitting is actual, then the feet that caused the split must be actual physical, not metaphorical. And the further proof it's physical feet is because Zechariah 9, 9 says the king who's Jehovah physically rides a donkey. Yeah, send him out of here. Physically rides a donkey. So then if he's physically riding a donkey, then he has a physical body. And that physical body has feet that touches the mount. Are you with me there? Is it all sinking in? But when he comes to the Mount of Olives and he touches it, he doesn't come alone. Zechariah 14, verse 5. Who does he come with? Watch here. Who does he come with? Watch. Wait, there's nothing yet. We haven't even gotten to the cross yet. Okay. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Jehovah, my God, my God. I mean, how much clearer can you get? It's Jehovah Almighty himself coming. The Lord, my God, not a creature. He is coming and all the saints with thee. Now, the word saints, Kadoshim, can also mean holy ones. One means yes, two means no, truth seeker. One means yes, we get it. Two means no. One is, yeah, that's a secret code with. Yeah, Sal, in this Old Testament context, it's referring to angels, Sal. In this Old Testament context, it means the angels. But did you catch it, Sal? Jehovah, my God, is coming with the holy ones, and they're going to land on Mount Olives where Jehovah's feet will split the mount. Now, remember what I said. Let's see if you guys are pay, paying attention. I said when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding a donkey, he was announcing to Jerusalem, I am the God that Zechariah said would come to reign as king over you, bringing salvation. I am the divine king, Zechariah told you, would come on a donkey. So he was telling the Jews, here I am, your God, the God of Zechariah, not a mere creature, but God in the flesh. And I'm presenting myself to you as your king to bring you salvation. Do you accept? Unfortunately, they didn't. Unfortunately, they didn't. So now what happens? Remember I said he began the fulfillment of the prophecy, but he'll completely fulfill it. He'll fulfill it completely when he returns, right? So when will it be completely fulfilled? When he returns. How do I know? Because pay attention to Zechariah 14 verses 1 to 5. Zechariah 14, right? Exactly, kingdom kid. 
Zechariah 14 says, Jehovah my God will land on the Mount of Olives and his physical feet will split in half and he comes with his holy ones. Let's see where Jesus will return to. Acts 1, verses 9 to 12. Where will Jesus return? Jesus will return to what location on earth? Acts 1, verses 9 to 12. Acts 1, verses 9 to 12. Watch here. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. So he went up physically before their eyes. A cloud received them. So he entered a cloud, and he disappeared in the cloud out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, because they're astonished, a physical body ascending, and they're seeing an actual physical body. They're actually seeing this. This actually happened. This is history, an event that they saw. A physical body of a physical man going up, and he enters a cloud, and he's gone. And that's why they're looking, they're stunned. Because their world was turned upside down. Imagine you were there to see it. You and me say, okay, Jesus, we'll see you later. You know how you'd be? Did my eyes just see what I saw, Peter? You saw it too, right? Thomas, you saw it? That's how they would be. So don't just read it. Read it and put yourself there. Jesus is standing in front of you. A man in a physical body. And all of a sudden, he starts ascending physically before your eyes. And he ascends and he's looking down at you as you're looking up. And as he's going up, he's smiling at you. And all of a sudden, he enters a cloud and he's gone. You're going to be like this. You're going to be in awe. Now let's read Acts 1, 10 to 12. Right? Acts 1, 10 to 12 again. Watch here. You're going to be mind blown. And when you see that, you don't care what man tries to do. You want to behead me? Let me, let me tell you something. When you see something like that, a dead man come to life and become immortal, and then that man that was dead then ascends physically and a cloud disappears, if they come with guns and knives, you're not going to say, you want me to deny Jesus? Because you think your threat of beheading me is going to make me deny him? Here, I'll help you. Here, bring the knife. Go ahead. Please behead me because he's worthy. I'm going to enter his presence. Nothing will shake you. Nothing will move you. Nothing will dislodge you from your faith after seeing that. Right? And that's a reminder of those Coptic Christians because though they didn't see, see him physically ascend, by the eyes of faith, by the testament of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to their spirits, Jesus rose physically and physically ascended, and he's alive. That's why when ISIS took them on that beach, and as they're about to behead him, you can hear them praising the Lord as their throats were being slit. Bismi Yesu, hallelujah! Because they knew Jesus is alive, and they're about to enter his presence. Right? May we have such faith. Acts 1, 10 to 12. Now here's the key. Jehovah God will come with his holy ones to Mount of Olives and split it in half. Acts 1, 10 to 12. Watch here. Exactly, Satu. You see that? Nothing will shake you. Acts 1, 10 to 12. Watch here. Let me show you who Jesus is. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So two angels are there. And notice what the two angels say, verses 11 to 12. Watch. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Why you keep looking? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in, the, in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He left physically into a cloud. A cloud will appear and it'll come down. The way he went up is the way he'll come down. He left this location, entered a cloud, he disappeared. A cloud will appear, and he'll come right back down. But right back down to where? Verse 12. Right back down to where? Verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, 
which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Jesus physically left the Mount of Olives into a cloud and entered heaven. The angels say, the way he left is how, is he, is, is how Holy Spirit loosened my tongue to glorify Jesus and never stop glorifying him. The way he left is how he'll return. So he left the Mount of Olives and he's going to return to the Mount of Olives. But hold on. Zechariah 14 says, the one who's going to descend on the Mount of Olives, whose physical feet will touch the Mount of Olives and split it, accompanied by his holy ones, is Jehovah. But Acts 1 says, the one who's coming to the Mount of Olives is Jesus. Did you catch it? Focus term. But wait, Pedro, let this sink in a little deeper. And the Joe Witness Bible reads the same way. You know what that means, Pedro and everyone else, if you're paying attention? You know what that means? Let me tell you what that means. When Zechariah saw the physical body of Jehovah and saw the physical feet, because he's seeing it in a vision, the Spirit is showing him, and saw the physical feet land, he was seeing the risen Christ in his glorified physical body returning from heaven. He saw what the physical resurrected body of Christ looks like. They don't have any good response, Captain, Captain. Oh, but wait, Jehovah was, isn't going to come alone, right, Pedro? He's not coming alone. It said he's coming with his holy ones, his saints. First, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. First, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Let's see who Jesus returns with. First, Thessalonians 3, verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Whoa! Jesus is coming with all the saints? Yes. Zechariah, who's coming with all the saints? Jehovah. Jesus will land on the Mount of Olives and his physical feet will touch it? Yes. Zechariah, whose physical feet will land on the Mount of Olives? Jehovah. Jesus rode a donkey in Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah? Yes. Zechariah, who is that king that will ride a donkey entering Jerusalem? Jehovah. So you're telling me Jesus is your Jehovah, Zechariah? That's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. Do you now, and mo many of you already know this. You've already known this argument. You've studied on your own. If you've heard me teach this, because this is not the first time I mentioned this. I've, made, I've used this argument over the years. And I'm not the first one to use it. Others have. But what's my point? Do you now more fully appreciate Palm Sunday that many Christians take for granted and have no clue what the significance of Palm Sunday is? You understand last week was Palm Sunday. You understand what that signified if you know your Bible and you care about the things of Jesus? Jesus was entering Jerusalem, presenting himself to Jerusalem as Jehovah their God in the flesh coming to reign and get, bring them salvation. That's what he was telling them. That's the significance of Palm Sunday. Sinking in? We haven't even gotten to the cross yet. Because I had to just talk about Palm Sunday. Right? I want this to sink in for a minute. Before I move on to the next one, it's Jehovah. Yes, the Hebrew word is Yod Hey Vav Hey, Yahovah Yahweh. So now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray He etches this in your minds and hearts. Never ever forget why Palm Sunday is so important. Now, when Palm Sunday comes, you're going to say, "This is the day Jesus was presenting Himself to Jerusalem." Here I am, Jerusalem. Jehovah, your God, your king. And if you recognize me, 
I am coming humbly, not on a war horse. And to confirm what a brother said, when a king goes to battle, he doesn't ride a donkey. He rides a war horse. But when Jesus was coming on a donkey, he was showing that he's not here to judge and destroy. He was coming humbly saying, I am offering myself to you as your rightful king. Accept me and receive my salvation. But now you've rejected me, right? Now let's see how Jesus will return. He entered on a donkey to show I'm not here to destroy or punish. I'm here offering myself humbly to you saying, do you recognize who I am? Jehovah, your king, your God. Do you accept me so I can give you salvation? But now let's see how he'll return. Remember, he came on a donkey. And this is something that's a fact of ancient Near Eastern life. When kings went to war, they battled on war horses and chariots. You don't ride a donkey when you're in an army, right? I mean, that's, that's not practical. Okay, but now let's see how he'll come. Let's see the depiction of how he comes at the second coming. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Watch here. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Oh, now that he comes to declare war and make war, he's not on a donkey, he's on a horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Okay? In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, the blood of his enemies, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in lin fine linen, and white and clean. Now notice, fine linen, linen, fine linen, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue and save me from my lisp, white and clean. Okay, I'm going to explain why that's significant. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. He will pour out God's wrath on the evildoers, on the beast, the false prophet, and their wicked armies that sided with him. Right, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, do you see the difference? He came on a donkey, humbly offering himself as their true king and their God who had become flesh. And if they recognized him, he was going to bestow salvation on them. They didn't. So now he doesn't come on a donkey. He comes on a war horse. And the armies come on war horses. Horses of war, because now he comes to destroy the beast, the false prophet, and all the armies that sided with them against the true king of kings and lord of lords. Right? Guys, I think I'm going to block William, Money, and Christopher. They're more excited about the rapture than they are about showing the deity and glory of Jesus Christ. Jacob's trouble in the rapture. That's more important to them than talking about how this shows that Jesus is the God man. You see the stupidity of some Christians? Right? But for the rest of you who are serious and listening, is it making sense? Okay, send William money out to go look for some money. Get lost, man. Get him out of here. He started the trouble. Get the guy out of here. Okay. Yeah, thank you, guys. Now, for the rest of you who are serious, you see how Palm Sunday testifies to Jesus being God in the flesh. Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. Jehovah the God of Zechariah, the true king of Israel. You see that, right? That's who Jesus was identifying himself as and doing that act. 
And they tell me, no, there is no Trinity in the Bible. Jesus never claimed to be God. Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? He's the God man. So you're reading Council of Nicaea theology into the scriptures. Right? Yeah. Even a blind man, if he's honest, even a deaf man, if he's honest, will say the Trinity is everywhere from beginning to end. Right? Now, why do you think the heavenly army, our Lord Jesus and the heavenly armies, are described as riding white horses and they have linen that is white? Why do you think that? Why do you think their horses are white and the clothing of those riding on white horses with him are white? Their linen was white. Not only priests, that linen this is the clothing of priests. Yes, purity. You know what it means? This army is a just army. It is a righteous army whose judgments are just so that you know if they come out and declare war, the people that they war against deserve the judgment and destruction. Because this is the only perfectly just army that only goes to battle when necessary and only battles those who've committed grave injustices and crimes and sins worthy of punishment. That's what it means. Because when it comes to worldly armies, there are times in which soldiers are sent out to fight unjust wars, to fight unjust battles, to commit atrocities against peoples that don't deserve what's being afflicted upon them. Because human armies are corrupt, sinful, and wicked. The only army that's perfect and righteous and only go out to war in perfect justice, inflicting punishment on people who deserve it, is the army of heaven. Right? This is the only army, the only army that you can know with absolute certainty that if they come out and declare war, the people that they war against deserve it fully because they do not go to war just for the sake of it. Right? Louisa, thank God that you can go back and rewind and listen because there's a lot of meat that you missed. But glory to God, it's recorded and you can listen to it. And catch all the meat. So if you want to start from the beginning, go ahead, sister. It's up to you. But you can just tag along. Because I want you to learn learn these arguments and see why Palm Sunday is so significant in proving the Trinity and that Jesus is the God-man. Now that we got all that taken care of, and I showed you now the significance of Palm Sunday, my prayer is that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll never forget all of these biblical revelations. You'll absorb them. If that means you have to re-listen until become second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit, please do so, so you can then teach others. And so now, if the Lord tarries and you live for more years, unless the Lord calls you home now, which would be better for us, next Palm Sunday, now you have a greater appreciation. I am celebrating the event where Jesus presented himself to Jerusalem as Jehovah, her king, not just as Messiah, Remember, the text didn't say it's Messiah. It said Je Jerusalem's king, who is Jehovah, the God of Zechariah. So when he did that, he was offering himself to Jerusalem, saying, Jerusalem, here I am. Do you recognize me? Do you know who I am? I am Jehovah, your God, who's become flesh. I am Jehovah, your rightful king. Will you accept me? Unfortunately, no, because by the end of the week, they had nailed them to the to a cross. Isn't it ironic? He enters Jerusalem, presenting himself as Jehovah, her king, and yet the inhabitants of Jerusalem had him hanging on a cross, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death by the end of the week. Good Friday. So now you want to see something significant with that event. I don't know, Zina, because when you say, does it show? The Gospel of John started by saying Jesus is God. And then John climaxes with Thomas confessing that Jesus is God. 
And throughout the Gospel of John, as well as the other Gospels, you have Jews recognizing he's claiming to be God, but denying that claim, rejecting that claim. So I don't know what you mean when you say anyone. All throughout the Gospel of John specifically, you have the Jews saying that you, a man, claim to be God. You make yourself out to be God. You make yourself out to be the Son of God who's equal to the Father. So we see it all the time. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know what you're asking specifically. But it's all there. They're recognizing he's claiming to be God. He's presenting himself as God. But he can't be God because he's just a Jew, no more, no less. Right? So that's what I'm saying. I don't know. But I hope I answered in, uh, to the best of my ability. Right? Now, let me repeat what I said so we can go into Jesus' words on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what I'm going to park on today. Know what I just said. Palm Sunday, when he entered, folks, listen, when he entered on a foal of a donkey, he was presenting himself to, you mean John, uh, you mean Revelation 19, 13, right, Jeremy? Not Revelation 19, 3. Yes. Revelation 19, 13, when he's called the word of God, that is John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Yes. Revelation 19, 13, Jeremy. Okay, now, when he entered into Jerusalem on a foal of a donkey. He was presenting himself as God Almighty in the flesh, the God that Zechariah prophesied was coming. Jehovah, Zechariah's God, right? But did they accept that proclamation? Did they recognize in the sense of saying, yes, you're God, we accept? No, they rejected it as blasphemy. They rejected his blasphemy. So what did they do by the end of the week? Hand him over to the Romans to beat him to a bloody pulp, whip him to the point of death, drive spikes in his nails and feet, nail him to a cross, gasping for breath, dying on the cross, and then they spear his side. They spear his side and they pierce him, right? But that too began the fulfillment of another prophecy in Zechariah 12. Lord willing, I'll do a session on Zechariah 12 in greater depth. But that too began the fulfillment of another prophecy in Zechariah 12 that awaits the second coming for it to be completely fulfilled. Let me repeat, because I want you to get this. Yes, kingdom. I want you to get this. Let me repeat. Jesus riding on a donkey and being pierced on the cross with the spear thrust. Those events began the fulfillment of the prophecies in Zechariah, but they haven't been completely fulfilled. Their complete, perfect fulfillment awaits the return of Christ. So he began fulfilling them and will complete their fulfillment when he returns. Clear? Is that clear? So the part of him coming to the Mount of Olives with his Holy One, splitting it in half, and reigning in Jerusalem after he destroys the armies of Antichrist, that awaits the second coming. And I just proved that to you. right? But the part of him riding a donkey, the, that happened at the first coming. Now it's possible he'll do it again. It's possible that when he enters Jerusalem, he'll again ride a donkey. We know he did it one time. He can do it a second time. But when he did it the first time, that's to signify, I am fulfilling the predictions. They're fulfilled in me and only me. Don't look to another because you have no other but me. But when they pierced him on the cross, that too fulfilled a prophecy in Zechariah that will be completely fulfilled, realized when he returns. You know what prophecy I'm talking about? Let's go to Zechariah 12, verse 10. When the nations come to try to destroy Jerusalem and God empowers Jerusalem to fight and he comes down to fight with them and for them. When he comes down, notice what happens. Zechariah 12 verse 10. Zechariah 12 verse 10. And I, this is God speaking, guys. It's God speaking through Zechariah. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. 
Jesus says through Zechariah, because it's Jesus speaking, when I return to destroy the armies of the nations that come up against Jerusalem, then Jerusalem will see me and they'll recognize that's the one we pierced. Jesus of Nazareth, he's returned. So he's been our God all this time and they're going to mourn bitterly and regret that they did not recognize him. They shall look on me whom they pierced. And their mourning will be as the mourning of the death of an only son. Now, is it a coincidence? Jesus is God's only son who died. So now, when did that part of the piercing, when was that fulfilled? Because notice it's saying, when I come, they'll re realize they had pierced me. That means the piercing took place before that event. They will look on me whom they pierced. That means they pierced him at some past moment, an event in the past. They did it to him in the past, and then he shows up, and they remember, realize that's the one we passed previously. That's the, I'm sorry. That's the one we pierced previously. That's the one we per pierced earlier. You catch it? So when will the complete fulfillment of it take place? Let's go to John 19, 34 to 37. When did, when did it begin to be fulfilled? When did the fulfillment of it start? And when will it be completed? So follow with me. Help me to help you. Let's focus for the glory of Jesus. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that we, he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. <whistles> so John says, the piercing part of Zechariah 12.10, fulfilled when he was on the cross, and the soldier pierced him. The soldier pierced him. So the piercing part already fulfilled. But the latter part where the tribes of, of Israel will mourn. The tribes of Israel will mourn and wail. When will that take place? When will that part take place? Revelation 1.7. Revelation 1.7. Notice when it will take place. What's up, Sarah? Are you Mahnaz's uh, niece? Good to see you. Revelation 1 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. Watch. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail, mourn because of him. Even so, amen. That's the complete fulfillment when he comes. Do you see it? So do you see? This theological motif called the already but not yet. The already but not yet. Thank you, Dad Jimich. God bless you. The already not yet means the prophecies started to be fulfilled already when Christ came. But the complete fulfillment is not yet. It awaits his return. Are you with me there? Yeah, wailing means lamenting, regretting, feeling remorse and guilt for what you did. Thank you, but my beloved shepherd. Are you seeing with greater clarity by the power of the Holy Spirit with every successive session? The entire book is about Jesus. It's all about him. It all points to him. He is its true fulfillment and its complete and perfect fulfillment. Right? Okay. So now we know the significance of entering into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. Right? Now we see this true significance of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. So now let's talk about our Lord's words on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are we now ready? Guys, help me to help you focus. 
Help me to help you by focusing. Help me to help you by paying attention. Attention. A lot of people misunderstand why Jesus said that. Now, many of you already know this because you've studied on your own and discovered it. And some of you have been with me in previous sessions and you've heard me exegete it. In fact, just recently, I exegeted that by the grace of Jesus Christ for my Ethiopian Christian brother when I was live streaming on his Facebook channel, which is archived now. Oh, and by the way, right after this, right after I'm done, around 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that means <clears throat> I'm going to try to stop my session around 8, 9 p.m. I'm doing another live session with Al Fadi for his Facebook live stream, which I'll give you the link before I end the session. So God willing, an hour and a half from now, I'm going live again. I'm going live again on Al Fadi of Sierra International's Facebook page. We're going to do a live stream for Facebook. So God willing, if you're hungry, come join us and I'll give you the link. Oh, he gave you the link already. All right. Now, with that said, Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. Praise God. May they keep increasing for the glory of Jesus. Okay. Matthew 27, 46, Mark 15, 34. Okay. Let's, let's read this because people don't make the connection and I'm going to make the connection for you. This is now about today. What today commemorates. What today commemorates. Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. Nike, by the grace of God, I pray the Holy Spirit hears you and makes us more knowledgeable, more in love with Jesus, more holy, more pure, so that for Jesus. But now focus so you can learn. Okay, guys, Protestant, you know you dropped the ball on that one, right? I was about to lay hands on you. Okay, Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Iri, Iri, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15, 34. Read with me. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, notice, ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, ninth hour in Jewish reckoning meant 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Ninth hour is Jewish reckoning. Thank you, Kingdom King. God bless you. Ninth hour is Jewish reckoning. That's 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That's why now, Protestant, do me a favor, switch to the NIV, post Mark 15, 34 in the NIV, or first to last, one of you, because I want you to know what in the ninth hour is by our reckoning. Our reckoning, it's 3 p.m. Antonio, you want me to just drop my subject and talk about Muslim concerns? Mark 15, 34. And at 3 in the afternoon... Three in the afternoon. So the ninth hour is three in the afternoon. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, here's the thing. Many people misunderstand Jesus' cry. People understand Jesus' cry as meaning that he's saying, why have you forsaken me and abandoned me? No, that's not the meaning. You know what the meaning of the, the Lord's words are here? Can I now tell you what it actually means and then unpack it? And unpack it. And I pray, Holy Spirit, show up in a mighty way. Move our hearts to break down in tears of love and thankfulness to you, to the Father and the Son for what you've done. Make our hearts tender and fill it with love for you, for the Father and the Son in Jesus' name. Not only the Psalms, but do you understand why he's saying those words? Let me give you the gist of those words. It's not just quoting the Psalm, but the significance of the Psalm. You can tell me Psalm 22 all day, all night. If you don't understand Psalm 22, you're not telling me anything. No, Jojo. No. Jesus' words mean, my God, my God, how much more la longer will you abandon me and not come to my aid? Let me repeat what Jesus is saying. Let me repeat what Jesus is saying. My God, my God, how much more longer will you abandon me and keep me in this abandoned condition until you come to my aid? In other words, 
It's a prayer to the Father. It ends now. It's time for reconciliation. It's not, you've abandoned me. It's, how much lo more longer will I be in this predicament? How much more longer will I remain forsaken now that all things are done? And the answer is, it's over. Your prayer has been heard. It's over. Do you understand what it means? No. Cristo Nesti. You're trying too hard. No. He's not saying to the Holy Spirit, my God. Don't try to find Trinity everywhere you see it. Are you going to create doctrinal problems? Exactly, Sylvester. Let me repeat what you said. It was a cry for the end. Now, you guys ready for me to prove that? Do you, are you ready for me to prove that? That it's a cry, it's over now, I paid the price, I've appeased the wrath of God, I've satisfied our justice, now it's over, it ends. Can I now pray that, for, can I prove that to you guys? If you're paying attention, can I, if you're paying attention, because I got to make sure you're getting this, honestly, I want you to get this from my heart, I want you to get this, understand it. Fall in love with our Lord even more and then teach it to others. Teach it to others. Let me prove it to you. Matthew 27, 45 to 46. Matthew 27, 45 to 46. If you're listening, it will be revealed to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. But just pay attention. Matthew 27, 45, 46. Here's what people miss and don't connect. 45 and 46. 46 is meant to explain 45. Now, from the sixth hour, from noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So when did the darkness end? At the ninth hour. 46 tells you why. That's when Jesus prayed. When he prayed, God removed the darkness as a sign. It's finished. The judgment is over. Are you now catching it? It is Jesus' prayer at the ninth, ninth hour that removed the darkness as a sign. His prayer is heard. The judgment ends. It's over. Are you getting it or no? Because I can't go further until you get this point. Are you getting it? Why did the darkness end at the ninth hour? Matthew and Mark tell you. Because that's when he prayed. How much more longer now that I've accomplished redemption, now that redemption is finished, now that our justice is satisfied, our wrath is appeased? And the answer from the Father is, it's over. It ends now. And that's why he removed the darkness. Do you see the power of the Son of God that even from the cross, what he asks, he gets immediately. He receives the answer to his prayer immediately. The Father and the Spirit rush to answer the request of their beloved. Immediately. When the Father and the Spirit hear the cry of the Son, immediately they respond, yes. The Father says to the Son, yes. And the Holy Spirit says to the one that he's one with, yes, it ends. You see how it happened? Did it sink in? It's his prayer that removed the darkness. It's his prayer that ended the darkness at three. That's why. Do you ever wonder why? Why did Matthew and Mark tell us the darkness lasts from noon to three? And then right away, right after that, they say, and Jesus cried at Three, because they're explaining to you why the darkness was removed. It was his prayer around the ninth hour that resulted in God removing the darkness at the ninth hour as a sign. The judgment is over. It is finished. That's the love of the Father and the Spirit for Jesus, the Son, holy. You see how much the Father and the Spirit love and adore the Son? Whatever he says, they do because they are one and in love with one another and cannot part from the other. Now, let me give you further proof. That's what it means. 
Let me give you further proof. That's what it means. Now, are you ready for me to unpack Psalm 22? Yep, kingdom. That's exactly what it is. The judgment he took for our sins. And I'll explain that a little more in depth. Just be patient. Walk with me. Follow me as the Holy Spirit guides us to see the profound depth, beauty, majesty, love of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, it's not Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not it. Don't worry about that. Don't get into what other pastors say. Just focus on sound exegesis of the scriptures. Now, let me prove to you that's the meaning by going to the source of Jesus' words. He was citing Psalm 22, verse 1. Let's go to Psalm 22, verse 1. Let's read it in context. And I'm going to show you how Psalm 22 is all about Jesus, nothing to do with David. It's all about Jesus, has nothing to do with David. Psalm 22, verse 1. To the other musician upon Ajaleth, oh my, these words, Shahar, Ajaleth, Ayaleth, Shahar, a psalm of David. Now pay attention to the full citation. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? You see now what the context is? It's not why you abandoned me. How much longer until you come to my aid, to my rescue? Read the second part. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? You see it? One more time, post it. And I'm going to show you it's all about Jesus. Let me show you. It's all about Jesus. To the chief musician upon Ayelith Shahar. Say that five times fast. A psalm of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it doesn't stop there. Why art thou so far? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now, let me show you what the psalmist goes on to say. Psalm 22, verses 23 to 24. Psalm 22, verses 23 to 24. Watch here. Notice what the psalmist says. Psalm 22, 23 to 24. Watch here. Watch what happens. Ye that fear Jehovah, praise him. Why should we praise him? All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. Why? Here's the answer. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. There you go. When I cried, he answered me. So now rejoice with me. Praise the Father with me. When I cried, he heard immediately. See, that's the psalm. That's what it means. You catch it? So now you're going to read what Jesus said in a new light. Now you're going to read what Jesus said in New Light. He wasn't saying, why have you abandoned me? His point is, it's done, Father. Father, it's done. I've absorbed the wrath on behalf of sinners. I've drunk the cup in their place. I have now satisfied the divine justice. The debt of sin has been fully paid. It's over. It's done. It is finished. And that's what he said. It is finished. And then when he says that, the father says, indeed, son, it is finished. And he removed the darkness from the land. As a sign, the judgment has ended. The price has been paid. We've been reconciled. That's what makes Good Friday good. Why is it good, Sam? Because the wrath of God was satisfied. God can now be at peace with those who turn to the afflicted one and trust in the afflicted one and cling to the afflicted one and believe that his afflictions were for them and they receive what he did on their behalf by faith and love and trust in him. And God is now at peace with us. That's why it's Good Friday. Making sense? Is it making sense now? But I'm not done yet. Not done yet. I just want to make sure you got it. 
Now, let me prove this is a psalm about Jesus. Let me prove this is a psalm about Jesus. Okay, ready? Psalm 22, verse 16. Psalm 22, verse 16. Watch here. Well, I'm not done, guys. Just bear with me. Let me make a thorough case. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. A thousand years before the Lord Jesus. David speaking by the spirit of Jesus. Jesus speaking through the mouth of David. Says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And crucifixion was not in use at that time. The Medes Persians started crucifying people 500 years after the psalm was written. So that's one. But now let's read Psalm 22, 18. Psalm 22, 18. See, now you see why, guys, I use the word dogs. I call dogs and blas blasphemers and wicked sinners dogs. That's what I call them. These filthy sinners who are making fun of me, they're dogs. Okay, Psalm 22, 18. Panos Filipio. Amen, brother. Okay. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Pay attention. What do they do? They divide my garments and then they cast lots. Who's going to get my clothing? Okay, now watch here. John 19, 23 to 24. John 19, 23 to 24. Watch here. Guys, I make, I got, make sure you're following. I want you to catch the meat of this. Now you see why Good Friday is good. John 19, 23, 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the goat was without coat was without seam, coat woven from top from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, let us not tear it in pieces, but cast lots for it, for whose it shall be. That the scripture may be fulfilled, might be fulfilled, which saith, they part my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Wow! Even that part of dividing the garments and casting lots for the clothing, the soldiers fulfilled it when they hung Jesus on the cross. <whistles> Psalm 22, verse 22. Psalm 22, verse 22. Psalm 22, verse 22. Not done. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. This is after God hears him. Now that God has heard me, now that God has delivered me, now that God has come to my aid, I will now praise him in the midst of my brethren. I will stand in the midst of the congregation and praise my father for what he did. He's going to come to his brothers in the congregation and say, look what the father did. He heard my cry. I conquered death. I'm risen. I'm alive. Never to die again. When was this fulfilled? Hebrews 2.12. Hebrews 2.12. Hebrews 2 verse 12. When was this fulfilled? Watch here. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. It was fulfilled when Jesus rose from the dead, gathered the disciples, and started his church, and proclaiming what the Father had done. It is the church that Jesus set up where he glorifies the Father in the midst of the church that consists of his brothers and sisters who believe in him, born of his spirit, covered by his blood. See that? So folks, I don't think you caught it. Psalm 22, 22 is talking about the church of Christ in the midst of the congregation. What's the congregation? Here, Hebrews 2, 12. Ecclesia, the word for church. The congregation is the church. 
God's children are the church. God's children gather together to be the church. And who's in their midst? The Lord Jesus, praising the Father in the midst of the church. The church that's made up of brothers and sisters of Christ, purchased by his blood, born of his spirit, sealed by his love, by his spirit, children of God that he purchased. There you go, right there. Hold on, sorry. Catching it? So Psalm 22 even speaks of the church. It even speaks of the church of Jesus Christ. In other words, you have to be the church. Born of the Spirit of God. Purchased by the blood of Jesus. Trusting in Jesus. For Christ to be in your midst and glorifying the Father in your midst. Catch it? And that's why Satan wanted to stop us from gathering. Through this coronavirus, he manipulated the governments to stop us from gathering. But Satan has been crushed under the feet of Jesus because he doesn't realize it won't stop us because God has now given us the blessing of the Internet. So now the brothers and sisters of our Lord, children of God, born of the Spirit, are now gathering all over the world in droves. And we're still glorifying Jesus. And Jesus is still in our midst filling us with his presence, his love, his spirit to glorify the Father with him. And that's what we're doing right now. That's what we're doing right now. Amen? Okay, let me give you the final part that shows it's all about Jesus. Amen. Notice, Satu emphasize it, I will sing your praises in the midst of the church. Folks, Jesus is saying, he wants the church to sing praises to God. And he joins us in singing. I will sing your praises in the church. So brothers, sisters, gather with me. Let us sing and glorify our Father together. Hallelujah. Beautiful? Beautiful, right? I'm glad the brother focused on that. Jesus is saying, I will join in your singing. I will sing the praises of my Father in your midst together. Brothers and sisters, my family, born of my spirit, of my love, of my Father's love, of His spirit, children of my God and Father, my brethren, come and let us sing praises to the Father. Hallelujah. You getting it? That's what you're reading, man. I'm, I didn't make it up. It's right there, Psalm 22, uh, 22. I didn't make it up. This is the God-breathed scripture, the voice of God. Right? Okay, now, let me give you a final section showing you it's all about Jesus. Psalm 22 is nothing about David. has nothing to do with David. It's Jesus speaking through David by the Spirit. Jesus taking David's mouth and pen. And moving him by the Spirit and speaking through him. This is Jesus speaking, not David. Now, let's go to Psalm 22. Let's read 4 to 8. Psalm 22, verses 4 to 8. Yes, yeah, send blast prophet to the stone so he can smooch it like a pagan pedophile that he is. Psalm 22, 4 to 8. Our fathers, watch here. Psalm 22, 48, pay attention now how this is going to be fulfilled in Jesus. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Thou, thou didst deliver them. So he's reminding God, like you delivered our fathers, you will deliver me because you're faithful to me, right? As you delivered them and they trusted in you, right? And they were not confounded. Now watch, read with me. Verse 5, they cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Now, verse 6, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men. People reproach me and insult me and belittle me and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They look at me and they laugh at me and they scorn me. They shoot out the lip. They sh shake the head saying, you know, shaking his like, 
right? We do that in my culture. That was seven. Now eight. He trusted on the Lord, Jehovah, that he would deliver him. But let him deliver him, seeing he delighted him. Now notice what it said. People mock me and scorn me, and they wag their heads like, hey, you trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver you. Let's see if this is what happened to Jesus. Let's go to Matthew 27. Let's read from 38 to 43. Wagging their head, shaking their head, hurling insults, mocking him, reproaching him, and saying, you trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver you. And now watch here. Matthew 27. God bless you guys for the support. 38 to 44. Read with me. Matthew 27, 38 to 44. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. Okay? And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. That's what Psalm 22 said they'll do, shake their heads. Right? Now watch here. Watch what happens. Wagging their heads. And they're saying, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Oh, sounds familiar. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Wow. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him, for he said, I am his son. That's exactly what we just read in Psalm 22, verse 8, didn't we? He trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Thank you, guys. Layla, God bless all of you. Are you seeing how every part of the psalm is fulfilled in Jesus? It even speaks of the resurrection appearance of Jesus. That Jesus, when God delivers him, would appear to his brothers in the church. Psalm 22, 22. That he would be delivered and he would appear, resurrection appearance, appearing after his affliction. And he'd be in the church, glorifying the Father with the church. It's all there. It's all there. Did it sink in? Okay, so now let's go back because we're almost done. Let's go back and break it down again. Why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that mean he was abandoned or in light of Psalm 22, his point is, how much longer will I remain in this predicament? How much longer will I remain abandoned as part of the punishment I endure for their sins now that everything is fulfilled, now that everything's accomplished, now that the divine wrath has been appeased, now that divine justice has been satisfied. It's fulfilled. No more judgment. And the father says, son, it's done. You know what the answer is from heaven? You know what is, uh, the answer is? As the son cries out, the father says, son, You've done it, All right? Basically, this is what the father was saying. This is what the father was telling the son. I want you to pay attention. This is what the father was saying. Son, you've done it. The judgment ends. Sinners can be reconciled. Our wrath has been appeased. Justice has been served because you took their place in judgment. Son, it's over. Time to come home. <clears throat> Every time I say that, it hits me in the heart. <clears throat> Every time I think about it, it hits me in the heart. Every, every time that this was the father responding and saying to the son, <clears throat> you've done it. <clears throat> son, you've done it. You've accomplished redemption. Come home. Come home to me, the one who loves you. 
right? I mean, every time, every time. I told myself, honestly, I said, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm just going to present the, the session. But I can't do it. Every time I think about it, the pain that the son experienced. The reason why the son did not want to drink the cup when he's praying, remove the cup, because the cup meant he would have to take the judgment of the Father and the Spirit and experience abandonment, which is the price of sin for a momentary time, for a moment in time, something that he dreaded from the core of his being. To experience forsakenness by the Father and the Spirit, the two persons he loves the most. So this affects, this affects the Father, Son, and Spirit because they were all broken, meaning heartbroken. Their hearts broke that the Son would have to be treated as a sinner so that the Father and the Spirit would have to pour out the wrath on the one that they loved and adored more than anything. So it wasn't just the son's heart uh, heartbreaking. The father's heart was breaking. The spirit's heart was breaking. To see the one they love and adore the most undergoing this punishment. And so when he cried out, <clears throat> it was with great excitement and joy and love to hear the sound of the beloved. The sound of the beloved. And remove the judgment. Son, it's over. Son, we love you, son. <clears throat> Come home. <clears throat> I can't, you see, I can't do it, man. Every time I talk about it, I end up crying. <whistles> right? Let me show you. Now, let's go a little deeper. I'm almost done. A little deeper. John 19, 28. Right? I, I said I wasn't going to cry. I can't, I can't do it. See if I... Even when Luisa posted, come home, come home, she's going to make me cry some more. Now, let me show you John 19, 28, the significance of John 19, 28. Okay, now read this. Now, let me impact the significance of this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. See, now he knew it's accomplished. That the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I thirst. Now, John's gospel is a spiritual gospel. What he wants you to see is what Jesus is thirsting for. Let me tell you what I thirst means in the Gospel of John. Are you ready? Can I show you what I thirst means in the Gospel of John? It's not physical thirst. Let me show you what it means. John 4, verse 10. John 4, verse 10, and verses 13 and 14. John 4, verse 10, and verses 13 and 14. Now pay attention, guys. Let me explain to you from John's Gospel. What thirst means. I am doing that right now, OJ. Pay attention. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, you would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, the water of the well, will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. So notice what thirst means. Spiritual thirsting, spiritual quenching, spiritual water. Now let's go to John 6.35. Let me unpack it for you guys. And I'm going to show you from the psalm what Jesus was saying. How he perfectly fulfills the psalm. John 6.35. Watch here. What does Jesus say? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay, now John 7, 38, 39. So if you come to Jesus, you'll never thirst. If you come to Jesus, you'll never hunger. John 7, 38 to 39. God bless you, Leah. Watch, guys. Watch what's going to happen. John 7, 38 to 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. So what is the living water? Guys, pay attention. 
What is the living water? Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So, thirst means thirsting for the presence of God. Thirsting for the fellowship with God. Thirsting for the love of God, because only God's love and fellowship can satisfy you. It's referring to the fellowship that we enjoy with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why don't we enjoy fellowship? Because of sin. So what's the punishment of sin? Because of my sin, I'm not in fellowship with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm not in communion with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I need to turn to Christ and be forgiven to then receive that water and that bread, which satisfies me, and I never thirst. So now you understand what Jesus was saying? He wasn't saying, I thirst for physical water. That's how they understood it. He was saying, Father and Holy Spirit, I thirst for you. Now that it's accomplished, now that I've experienced the judgment of forsakenness because of sin, now that I have paid the price, I thirst for you, Babi, my Father. I thirst for you, Holy Spirit. I thirst for you. And that's when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when they answer, that's when he could say, it is finished. And he gives up the spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So the son was thirsting and aching for the companionship and the fellowship of the father and the spirit. Because part of the punishment that he took was to experience God forsakenness. Let me show you Jesus' words in the psalm. Psalm 43, verses 1 to 2. This psalm captures Jesus' point. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. I'm sorry. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 63, verse 1. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. Watch here. Uh-huh, Pedro, you got it. To the chief musician, Maschil, for the sons of Korah, as the heart, the deer, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and be, appear before God? That's what Jesus was saying. My Father, my God, I thirst for you. Holy Spirit, I ache for you. When will I come into your presence? And when he says that, the darkness is removed. It is finished. And then in Luke 23, 46, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, my soul that thirsts for you. That's what happened. That's what happened, guys. You understand what the Lord experienced and the Father said, I'm going to cry again. I said I wasn't going to cry, but I can't help it. Because you understand, you understand what the Godhead did for us in time meant the Father's heart was broken, the Spirit's heart was broken, and the Son's heart was broken because they had to do the thing that they dreaded the most. Give the cup of God's wrath to the son so the son could drink it. So imagine the one you love more than anything, drinking the wrath that you deserve so that you could be spared. And the father seeing it and the spirit seeing it and they're seeing the agony of the son, the one they love more than anything. And so when he fully drank it, fully took it in, fully absorbed it and it's done. And he can look to the Father. Bobby. <clears throat> Alahi. <clears throat> oh, man. I told you this, this breaks me, right? <clears throat> Why have you forsaken me? And the Father responds. 
My son, I have heard your cry. Amen. I've heard your cry, my son. Come home. Come home. <clears throat> it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, now you know why it's Good Friday, right? Do you understand why it's called Good Friday now? You see why now I have such a zeal, even though it's imperfect and I love him imperfectly and I fail him. Do you see why I have such a zeal and love for the triumph God and why I have such a passion to fight for the glory of the Trinity and the honor of the Trinity, even though they don't need me? Right. We will never be able, <clears throat> we will never be able to repay what the Godhead did for us because of us creatures. I want it to sink in right now. I want it to sink in right now. Okay. Because of us creatures and our sins, the Godhead who doesn't need us, doesn't need us, but out of their love chooses to save us had to experience on that day on Calvary something they've never, never experienced before. Heartbrokenness as the Father and the Spirit handed the cup for the Son to drink. And they did it anyway to save us. Maggots that they don't need. How can you not be in love with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Now, let me end it with this. Let me end it with this, all right? Praise God, we had about 250 today. I pray more people come for his glory. I pray he will wash me, wash us. Pray he will bring my daughters and resurrect my relationship with them this resurrection Sunday and keep us pure for the glory of Jesus. Now, let me end it with this. Jesus, pay attention. Jesus, only son, only son, crucified on the cross on the feast of Passover, right? Crucified, thank you, Magdalene, on the feast of Passover, right? It was a feast. It was a feast, right? Are you listening now? Because I want to end it with this. And then I got to get prepared for my live stream with, with El Fadi. All right. Now we're going to put the NIV I want you to read the NIV here because I want you to see the time. Do me a favor, Protestant or first and last. Put the NIV, Mark 15, 33. The darkness came up what time? Mark 15, 33. I had said I wasn't going to cry, honestly. I didn't want to. But anyway, Mark 15, 33. Okay. At noon, pay attention, at noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. One more time, post it. I want everyone to read this. Amen, Louisa. You're going to make me cry, Louisa, by saying that. Yeah. yeah. Mark 15, 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So notice, noon, it became completely dark. When did it become dark? On the Feast of Passover. A festival of the Jews, a holy day of the Jews. Okay? Okay, now remember that. Don't forget that. Amos 8, verses 9 to 10. Thank you, Phantom. Thank you, brother. Amos 8, verses 9 to 10. From the NIV, because I want you to see this. Amos 8, verses 9 to 10. Forget about the lambs being sacrificed. You went somewhere else around here. Pay attention. Satu, God bless you. Guys, let's see if you catch it. Amos 8, verses 9 to 10. Read. In that day declares the sovereign Lord, sovereign Jehovah. I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals, a festival, 
into mourning and your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. That's what they did when someone died. They would shave their heads and wear sackcloth. It's not a mourning because someone died. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. I don't think you caught it. One more time. Amos 8 verses 9 to 10. God bless you guys. Thank you for your support. Let's see if you caught it. Let's see. Hold on. One more time. God says, this is how you're going to know I'm bringing judgment upon the land. Here's a sign I'm bringing judgment on the land. Amos 8, 9 to 10. Guys, don't text, just read now. In that day, declares the sovereign Jehovah, I will make the sun go down at noon in that day. Okay? And darken the earth in broad daylight. At noon, I'm going to make it completely dark. When? I will turn your religious festi festivals during one of your festivals, like the Feast of Passover, into mourning. And all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads, which was the sign of mourning. When someone died in your family, you'd shave your heads and wear sackcloth. I will make that time like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Who caught it? Who just read this and caught what I just read? God bless you, Azul Luza. Who caught this passage in Amos 8, 9 to 10? But what did it say? What was going to happen? Not just only son. What's going to happen? See, that's why I didn't want you guys to text. I want you to pay attention. God bless you, DKK. Watchman. Hey, night protection. God bless you, man. Is night protection here? I didn't see him. God bless him, man. I didn't even see the brother. All right, good. All right. Pay attention. God says, here's a sign of judgment. Here's a sign of judgment. Pay attention here. Here's how you know I'm going to judge the land. At noon, I'm going to make it completely dark during your festivals. And I'm going to make you mourn as if you lost an only son. Now, why was it tragic to lose an only son? Because the only son was the heir who carried your name. If I have an only son and he dies, my inheritance goes to my servants and I have no one to carry my name. So you see how bitter it is to lose an only son? So God said, God said, listen to what God said. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to turn your festivals in a time of mourning and make you mourn so bitterly as if you lost your only son. And here's a sign of judgment. I'm going to make the land go dark at noon. But wait, folks. Folks, Jesus was crucified on the cross and the festival of Passover, and it went completely dark at noon, and here was the only son who died. Exactly what Amos 8 verses 9 to 10 said would happen when God brings judgment on the land. Did you guys catch it? God bless you, my brother, night protection. I don't know if you've caught it. God says, during your festivals, I'm going to make it go dark at noon. And I'm going to make you mourn and weep as if you lost an only son. The festival of the Passover. It went completely dark at noon as the only son of God hung on the cross. And the Father and the Spirit and the inhabitants of heaven wept that day heaven wept because they lost heaven's only son you understand what happened so if you know your old testament and you saw that it went dark at noon pay attention dark at noon and it's the festival of passover you know what you're going to say God is angry today, and he's pouring out judgment. But on who? This is a sign of judgment. Amos said that when we see it become dark at noon during our holy days, festival, God is judging the land. Who? The only son on the cross. So you understand what the darkness represented now? The darkness at noon meant God's judgment was being poured out. But on who? The only son. So imagine now the son. And he says, Father, 
I'm ready. Pour out the judgment that they deserve upon me. So from noon till three, he drank the judgment of God. And as it was happening, heaven was mourning the death of the only Son of God. There was weeping and mourning. Heaven was weeping. The Blessed Mother of our Lord was we weeping. The disciples were weeping. Heaven wept. Heaven wept as they saw. See, I'm going to end up. It's going to break me down again. As they saw the only son, <clears throat> the, the darling of heaven, being judged on our behalf and the wrath, which the darkness represented being poured out. Can you imagine the son hanging there on the cross and taking it in? Taking it in. And you know why? You know he took it in? He says, this is for Danny. This is for Sam Shamoon. This is for Protestant believer. This is for Louisa. I drink this for first and the last. This is for Jai. This is for Christos Anesti. I drink this so they don't have to drink it. Because I love them. Because I love Sam Shimon. Because I love Danny Zia. I love them all. And I drink that for them. That's what he did. This is why it's called Good Friday. So, Please re-listen to this. Pass it on to others. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that this session was from you to bless us. That we don't leave this session the same, but you impact us to see what you did, what the Father did and the Son did for our salvation. And to love you more passionately. Preserve us for your glory in Jesus' name. Night protection, I just want to say to you guys, night protection is my brother from my heart. I love him. I haven't talked to him, unfortunately, in a while because I've been in my own trials. But I just want you to know, Night Protection is an amazing, humble man of God, my brother from the hip. I love him and his family. Can you pray blessings on Night Protection? Pray blessings on his on his uh, security business. Pray blessings on his wonderful, godly wife and his three handsome boys. That God will bless them. He is dear to my heart. In fact. He was actually my best man in my wedding. I love this brother. He hasn't given me permission to give you his name. But if you want security, contact him, Night Protection. Bro, I love you. Hopefully we'll talk soon. Sorry. It's not I've forgotten you. I've been trying to just do what I need to do for the glory of Jesus. And hopefully after the virus, I'll come and see you. He's also a fellow Jiru. I love this brother. I love all of you. I hope you're blessed. Now you know why it's Good Friday. Because it is the goodness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being revealed for maggots, worms like us who deserve hell. But they loved us so much to say, no, we won't give you what you deserve. We will give you our heart. And our heart hung on the cross for you. The heart of the Father, the heart of the Spirit hanging on the cross for you. Here is our heart. Will you take our heart? Will you take Jesus? The Father saying, I gave you my heart. My heart hung on the cross. The Spirit says, my heart hung on the cross for you. Will you now honor us by then receiving our heart into your heart, into your lives? Will you love our heart and cherish him? Will you live for him? Will you adore him? Will you be willing to die for him? Because he died for you. Our heart was nailed on the cross for you. Will you love our heart? His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Let me leave you with this. The Father's heart became flesh. The Holy Spirit's heart became flesh. Holy Spirit, please 
let penetrate what I say in their hearts to have no doubt this is true. It's from you. The father's heart became a human being. The spirit's heart became a human being. His name is Jesus. And the father and the spirit nailed their heart on the cross for you. And now the father says, will you receive my heart? The spirit says, he's my heart too. The Spirit says, the Father's heart is my heart. He's my heart too. Will you receive him? And you know what our response should be? Father, of course we receive your heart. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, of course we'll receive your heart. Your heart is our heart. And without your heart, we cannot live. Our heart is Jesus of Nazareth. The beautiful, blessed, virgin son of Mary. We love you in Jesus' name. He's risen, risen indeed. I got to do a live stream with Al Fadi Protestant. Can you post the link? I'll be going on in, in 42 minutes. 42 minutes on, on Facebook. Can you give him the link? So if you want to hear, and also Pastor Leland will be preaching, my dear pastor. Oh, by the way, Pastor Leland, if you're here, night protection was my best man that you... Uh, Pastor Lena was the one who did my wedding. Yeah. And so Pastor Lena will be preaching too on Enoch. Go hear him. There's the link, guys. Protestant believer gave you the link. El Fadi Sierra International. Love you guys. Lord Jesus willing, I'll do something tomorrow. But Sunday, I won't do anything. Because Sunday, I just want to rest in Jesus and his resurrection. But God willing, I'll do something tomorrow. We'll do it around between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, he's risen, he's alive, he's real, and he's in love with you. And his name is Jesus. Amen.